be better cleansing your body by actually eating the apple, eating the spinach. Or fasting. <laughs> Fasting's great for cleansing. <laughs>
and you definitely need to nourish your body if you're trying to lose weight. When we are restricting calories, you are restricting the energy source of your body. You're also restricting the energy source of your brain. Yes and no, once again. So uh, a lot of the keto guys have figured this out, but if you restrict calories intentionally and you're smart about it rather than just eating a very low number of calories throughout the entire day your body switches over from burning those calories for fuel and it burns fat for fuel right fat body fat can be our fuel source ketones right it's the energy we take from fat and we use for the brain for the body and so Again, this is not totally true, but again, it has to be done intentionally because if you're eating every you know, two to three hours and you're only having like 100, 200 calories per meal, yes, then you're robbing yourself of those nutrients and that energy because your body's not gonna be adequately able to switch over to burning fat. So there's the devil's in the details, you know? Like starving yourself is very different from fasting. We don't wanna ever starve ourselves. We don't wanna ever feel like we're just like super, super starving. But if you fast the right way, it's a really solid way to switch over to burning body fat for fuel. And again, having those positive responses. And if that's happening, then, you know, very primitive protective mechanisms start to kick into place where your body senses that as a physiological threat and does start to shift your metabolic balance to burn less because it's getting less. It's this is true if you're starving yourself. This is not true if you're in a fasted state. I just feel like I gotta qualify. It's kind of like a bad budget, right? So if you have a paycheck um, and you're running out of funds, you're going to conserve how much you pay till your next paycheck. Your body does the same. Your body will jump into this protective, physiological, biological mechanism to reduce the amount of energy you're using, which is why it is hard for people to maintain weight. And starving yourself can also shrink your muscles. You want to make sure that you're not eating less than 70% of your overall calorie needs. If you do, that's where not only are you probably going to feel extremely hungry and it's going to take you off of any goals that you're setting, but you're probably going to start compromising your muscle mass as well. And that's where weight loss is going to be unhealthy. Yes, unless you're in a fasted state. So they've done studies on this. I feel like this whole video is just going to be me defending fasting. <laughs> uh, the human growth hormone that elevates during fasting, as well as a, a couple other hormonal responses, preserves your muscle mass while you're in a fasted state. So also worth mentioning. But while the amount of calories you consume matters, the timing might not. Timing of meals is always a big question. Everyone comes to me and they kind of smirk and they think that I'm going to give them a thumbs up when they say, I don't eat after 6 o'clock or 7 o'clock. And I say, oh, all right, <laughs> do you enjoy that? And they say, no. And I say, well, then maybe eating after is okay. Because timing of day is not going to affect weight loss. Calories are what's going to affect weight loss. How do these guys have jobs, man? How? So, yes and no, okay? There's a line, but what we gotta understand is that when it comes to fat loss, it's calories in versus calories out. We have to start putting more emphasis on calories out. Calories out is the bigger picture that a lot of us need to care more about. And so if we eat late at night and we go to bed and our stomach is full, a lot of the energy that would normally go towards restoration, right? Improving metabolism, building back muscles we've broken down, now it has to go to digestion. And so the energy is gonna be digesting rather than recovering. And so we're gonna wake up less recovered than we could have been if we didn't eat late at night, which is gonna allow us to have a faster metabolism. So it does impact it. Now, if you eat a meal at 8 p.m., is it the end of the world? No. If you're consistently having huge snacking meals late at night, maybe that could lead to you gaining weight, right? But there's a line and saying that it doesn't have any impact is not true. For body fat loss. So if you eat a bunch of additional calories and you're in calorie surplus and those are coming late at night, then that's what's causing something like weight gain. And what about eating first thing in the morning? It depends on the body and it depends on the person and their relationship with food. For a lot of people, me included, if I don't eat a meal, I usually feel like very deprived and it's like I want to make up for it later. If that happens, then that's where we can add in like a lot of calories. Personally, I'm a huge advocate of breakfast. Our body runs on fuel and food is our fuel. Or body fat is our fuel if we switch over. So E's up there, I think her name's Nikita. So e no. No, if we look at this, it's okay to eat a little bit more. So let's say you skip breakfast, you're doing intermittent fasting. It's okay to eat a little bit more on that first meal that you break. But if you're smart about what you break it with, which is what's so important, you're going to eat a little more, but it's not going to compare to the calories that you typically eat in the morning. And you're going to have a better physiological response. Your metabolism is going to be faster. Studies have shown this 12 hours, 14 hours, 15 hours. The longer your fast, the quicker your metabolism, the more calories you burn, even if the amount of calories you consume during the day is equal. So more things that aren't true. 
So if we have our breakfast, then we feel we have more sustained energy throughout the day. And if breakfast is literally break fast. So technically if I ate at 2 p.m., I would be eating breakfast. So, and that first meal is important and you should eat enough. You shouldn't feel like you're starving yourself. I will say there are cases where people do feel deprived, right? If you have a heavy eating disorder, maybe fasting isn't right for you. But to say that it's not a good idea to eat, eat breakfast and make that a blanket statement, not a good idea. If you do choose to eat breakfast, feel free to go for that 2% yogurt. Now, fat is incredibly necessary. We should not be afraid of fat. We need fat in the diet. Fat's gonna be necessary for things like absorbing nutrients, like the fat soluble nutrients, like vitamin A and D and E and K. And you also need to make sure that fat, specifically cholesterol, is what's gonna help produce things like your hormones. So things like estrogen and testosterone growth hormones. So we need all those kind of things. Not only is fat healthy, but fat-free foods are often loaded with sugar or salt. So if you have a whole food product and you're removing the fat of it, it's gonna taste completely different. You probably wouldn't even like it, but what they're gonna do is replace that flavor with something else. And usually it's either sodium or sugar. So with sugar, when we have like a yogurt that has the fruit at the bottom, they're gonna have way more sugars than if you had like a 2% Greek yogurt. And as it turns out, fat isn't the only nutrient you can keep in your diet and before we get into the carbs, uh, this is very true. So studies have actually shown full fat dairy versus low fat or non-fat can lead to higher weight loss results. So the low fat, non-fat thing is totally a craze. I don't agree with it. I don't buy yogurt or anything like that unless it's full fat. So it's absolutely worth mentioning. Still lose weight. One of the biggest myths I get about carbs is that you must omit them from your diet to lose weight or my body doesn't digest them well and I have to omit them because I never lose weight unless I restrict myself. It's not true. And it's just not sustainable. Agreed to an extent. I'm a firm believer in lifestyle, right? Lifestyle fat loss. So if you're going out to eat and there's a, a sandwich that looks amazing and you're only going out to eat every once in a while, like have the sandwich. Don't worry about the carbs. However, if you're cooking at home and for every lunch you're having a sandwich with just processed white flour or white bread, that's going to be an issue. Make a swap for a smarter bread like Ezekiel bread or just cut the bread out and just have something that doesn't include bread. So it's all about being intentional here. Um, there's that level, right? Where if you go out, you should be able to enjoy yourself. You shouldn't have to say no because something has bread, but in your day-to-day -day life, when you're cooking for yourself, when you're making your own decisions, probably a good idea to cut out processed carbs or at least drastically, drastically reduce them. So it's almost impossible to have a no carb diet. Fruits and vegetables are known as carbohydrates and we must get those for their nutrients. Why carbs have a bad name? It's because of the simple carbs. The carbs that you see pre-packaged that are the cookies, the cakes, the sodas, the potato chips, they're called simple carbs because the chemical structure of them is usually one to two glucose molecules put together. So when you have like a small glucose molecule, it's easy for them to break away. But with our complex carbs, they are really long chains of carbon that are usually about 18 carbon long. And then by the time that your body starts to break it down, it's gonna take a while. And that's exactly what we want because it helps balance our blood sugar and also that fiber keeps us full for longer and then also prevents us from snacking. So eat your carbs. Definitely eat your carbs and eat your bread. Bread's delicious. It's only one of my favorite things. <laughs> Yeah, get it from a good source. Ezekiel bread's amazing. And as far as increasing carbs, I totally agree. I've worked with a couple of clients who just had very intense exercise schedules. So long walks, uh, long bikes, things like that. And they stalled with their weight loss progress. And when we increased the amount of carbs they ate, they started losing weight again. So carbs are very, very important because especially if you're doing something high intense, your body's gonna tap into those carbs for your energy source. And she has a pro tip for finding bread with more complex carbs. Read your ingredient list. With bread, Yep. It's the a lot of those mass produced breads that are in the bread aisle that are shelf stable they can last a month without getting mold on them and when you look at the ingredient list it's probably about 50 ingredients long they're the ones we want to avoid that's my get girl bread, get the fresh bread that comes from the local bakery which is usually around the deli counter area inside in grocery stores or ezekiel those will have it's frozen maybe four or five ingredients it'll mold after two days but you can preserve it by just putting it into the freezer and take it out as you need it and I also wonder, she has a slight accent. I wonder if she's from Europe because the ingredients we use here in the States are different than Europe. So maybe a store-bought bread uh, from the bakery in Europe is solid, but here in the States, it's still not that great. Like Ezekiel bread, unprocessed, something without enriched bleach, bleach flour is what we really want to look for. Speaking of bread, what about going gluten-free to lose weight? Gluten-free for weight loss can be a huge marketing ploy. Mm -hmm. So with gluten-free, there are a lot of people that do have an intolerance to gluten, or they have celiac disease, 
quick is where the body starts. Real quick, some people think they have an intolerance to gluten, but they actually have an intolerance to glyphosate, which is the pesticide. Uh, we put a video out on this, which you can go check out. But it's crazy. People travel to Europe where glyphosate is illegal, and they have bread or pasta, and their body doesn't interact the same way as it would here in the States. It's attacking itself and can deteriorate the body. But there are also people without these conditions who are looking to... Blame something, like the gluten, without checking the rest of their diet. If you are honest with yourself, recording your food, checking the ingredients, and then you eat the gluten and you feel the intolerance, then great. But a lot of people will choose to just jump in and being like, gluten is the enemy. So most of us don't need to cut out gluten or fat or carbs to lose weight. But there are some products better left on the shelf. The diet sodas are terrible with all the added preservatives in them and the hidden sugars. A lot of the added sugars are the synthetic sugars that are supposed to be great because they don't release insulin, which then doesn't cause a spike in blood sugar levels. But internally, if we don't stimulate the release of insulin, those sugars, the synthetic sugars, go to the liver, build up around the liver, hinder the functioning of the liver, and then can lead to non-alcoholic fatty disease. If this is the first time I've heard this explained so simply. All right, she started off weak. She gained my trust back here. Yeah, it's it's literally treated like alcohol. So when we have alcohol, if we until the body processes the alcohol, we stop digesting foods, and so they can be converted to fat. And so basically, what aspartame does or sucralose is it's pretty much the same. As they go process through the liver, the body stops digesting other foods and processing other foods until that stuff has been processed by the liver. So. I'm gonna wow. have a soda, which I have once in a blue moon. It will be the real thing. Yes, there's more sugar in it, but it's something that I don't have on a regular basis. Better yet, she says, drink water. Just up your water, add fruit to it. Add some mint or cucumber, lemon. Yes, it'll take a little bit for your taste buds to reset, but you're getting so many nutrients from that water and your body requires water for it to function optimally. Water is one of the six nutrients that the body needs. And when we're dehydrated, it also mimics the signs of hunger. So people turn to food a lot if they're dehydrated, not realizing that they're not hungry. It's just your body saying, give me some water, I'm thirsty. And what about juice? Oh, the juice cleanses. <laughs> so juice cleanses are like one of my pet peeves. If you're having a juice every once in a while, great. You're still getting the antioxidants out of it. You're still getting the nutrients, but you're removing that fiber. And fiber is key for the body to support gut health. With a lot of juice cleanses, they're hella expensive, and we have this belief that they're going to be better for our bodies, or it's a cleansing effect of our body. Realistically, what's happening is that when you have those juice cleanses, they're mostly coming from like fruit sugars, and then the vegetable sugars, it's a high, high amount of fructose in the body. When the body consumes excess fructose, it has a spasming effect of the GI tract. That can then to the cleansing effect. So that when we are actually having a reaction that. to the high amounts of fructose in the body, people think it's a cleansing effect because the marketing toys have led us to believe that way. But it's not. So you would be better cleansing your body by actually eating the apple, eating the spinach. Or fasting. <laughs> Fasting's great for cleansing. <laughs> and eating all the other fruits that are in that cleanse. That would be better for you because fiber is our natural detox. What it does is it goes through the body, picks up like excess fat, metabolic waste, and help cleanse it out. But juice cleanses aren't the only diet fads that don't often work. Intermittent fasting is not no! like it all the time. It's, we can kind of put in that myth category. Now, it can restrict calories and at least temporarily help you lose weight. If you're only allowed to eat food for eight hours, that just gives someone a lot of structure, and that can be very, very helpful. You can only get so many calories in your mouth in that time. Uh, on the flip side, someone can get a lot of calories in their mouth during that time as well. So someone can, and I've seen many people do it, they've gained weight through intermittent fasting, so it's not just going to be this quick fix. There's nothing magical to it. And the same goes for many... That's true. Just because you're fasting doesn't mean you're going to lose weight, right? There's other strategies there. However, if you do longer fast, 24, 36, 48, multiple of those, like there's pretty much in a lot of cases a guarantee that you'll lose weight. But no matter what you're doing with your eating schedule, you do have to be intentional with the foods that you actually eat. So yes, you can intermittent fast. And if you're justifying it with, well, I just fasted so I can eat whatever I want, you're probably going to maintain weight or potentially gain it. But if you're smart, you'll lose the weight, right? You just have to be very intentional with the food you eat when you are actually eating. Many popular diets. So one of the common diets right now that is um, gaining popularity is a ketogenic diet. So a lot of people who are doing that are just eliminating carbohydrates, which is why that's hard to sustain because your body does need carbohydrates for a reason. To be honest, there's not a lot of research that's saying that that is something that is helpful. There's, there's a lot of research that's saying, that says that keto is helpful. Um, I will dispute that. Like, 
a lot of research. But what I will say is I don't think it's a good idea for sustainability, right? If you go out to a wedding, if you go to a party, if you go to a restaurant, trying to eat keto, I mean, it's probably easier now because a lot of restaurants cater to that, but it's still difficult. And just saying no to pasta for the rest of your life or cereal for the rest of your life can be a difficult decision. I don't recommend it. I mean, it can be a good strategy to eat like leaning keto, but I think having that leniency with allowing carbs is a really good idea. Maybe a lot of research in mice models, but that hasn't been transcribed into human studies. And while people have lost weight on keto, it's often not without side effects. They're eliminating whole grains and legumes, um, certain fruits and vegetables, um, and really increasing their um, fat intake, which although fats are important, excess of any nutrient can cause metabolic changes in your body that will impact your cardiovascular health, your physical health, your metabolic health. So an example would be patients that we're seeing in the clinical setting are following ketogenic diets, are seeing weight loss, however, are coming with higher cholesterol markers, they're coming with higher LDL markers. They're... Yeah, but cholesterol doesn't matter. So cholesterol is a myth. I'll be putting a video out about this. Subscribe to the channel if you're not already. Coming with more irritable bowel symptoms, um, they're coming with more gastrointestinal discomfort. The truth is, there's no one tool that will make you magically lose weight. I think the most prevalent um, concept around health thesis is biohacking, which is this idea that you can defeat biology, you can work around your um, genetic predispositions, your metabolic parameters, and that is actually not true. And the reason for that is because you cannot defeat biology. You cannot um, hack hunger, you cannot hack access to healthcare, you cannot hack motivation. And this idea that, you know, again, if those results are there, you're going to um, be able to feel more satisfied is also not true. So this biohacking works on this concept of this belief that, you know, you can work your way and, you know, fix your body. And that prescribes to the social construct that it is up to you to change that. And you can absolutely biohack. I don't know what she means by that. So, I mean, biohacking is such an interesting concept. So maybe we're using different definitions for the term. I see it as making changes with your biology to achieve some sort of results, right? And so like an ice bath is an awesome biohack because it massively speeds up your metabolism, stimulates the vagus nerve, which helps you pull yourself back naturally from that fight or flight. Um, there's a lot of other benefits from it. And so we can do certain things. Biohacking, fasting is a biohack to where we reduce hunger, we reduce our appetite, we speed up our metabolism. I don't know what she's saying. And that's also why most diets don't work. They're hard to sustain, they're hard to maintain, so the results are very temporary, which is why we go back to something, trying something new. It's important to focus on behaviors rather than outcomes. Where you should start is record your food. A simple food log to lose weight, it's really just being honest with yourself, identifying your foods and the hidden ingredients that could be contributing to excess of hundreds and hundreds of calories per day. Take olive oil. Olive oil is great, but when we cook with it, we usually free pour it into a pan. Each tablespoon of olive oil has 128 calories. Now, if you're pouring in like six, seven, eight tablespoons with your vegetables, you're getting almost like a thousand calories that you don't need. So, pro tip for cooking with olive oil. Put it in, wait till your pot, your pan is hot. Once it's hot, add one to two tablespoons of olive oil and then add in your vegetables. When the pan is hot enough, it will disperse easier and then you use less. Also, once you put the vegetables in, some water and moisture will come from those vegetables and will add to the liquid in the pan. So you actually don't need to add excess in. And if you are being mindful of what you eat, the whole idea of cheating, Kearney isn't a fan. Yeah, diets, I mean, a diet, it depends how you define diet, right? Like, I, I think anything that has rigid rules that you can't bend and you can't break can be a negative thing, right? Kind of like the keto thing. Like if you can't have carbs, period, breaking it could lead to binging and spiraling and all that. That's why I love fasting so much is because it's flexible because you don't have to fast every day, right? Like even if you're doing intermittent fasting where it's 16 to 18 hours, if you have breakfast with a loved one, you don't have to fast, right? It's not like there's this rigid set of rules. It allows you to be much more flexible. And as far as this myth, we'll see what she says before I talk about it. I don't think there's any cheat meals. I don't like the word cheat. I think it gives it this it gives us this like higher power like oh this is really bad and you know i can't believe i did this i completely fell off the wagon yeah i like treat meals like treat t-r-e-a-t much better term it's also could just not have a term right it could just be going out and enjoying yourself every once in a while i don't know how i feel about like predicting treat meals i don't know how saying like hey this saturday is going to be a treat meal i'm going to go in because i think there's a potential to make a little bit worse decisions because of that but i also like the predictability of like if you're sticking to something which you do enjoy throughout the week but looking forward to that meal on the weekend maybe it's a good thing to help with your compliance just a thought no remove that because then you're going to want it more but feel even more guilty about it if you go out and you're socializing you're trying out one of new york's like best restaurants that's filled with cream and butter enjoy it just try Facts. to get a salad to start 
and filling up on salad is a great way to cut the calories and then have like one of the appetizers that are not in line with your health goals with your table and share because sharing is caring and there's more good news you can still lose weight while drinking occasional alcohol if you're sticking to the cleaner food yep you, you can being intentional i did a whole video about this so you can check that out if you want but being intentional on the timing and also obviously not overdoing it and she said occasional i believe it's easier to lose weight if you just cut out alcohol period but i'm working with clients that have literally had like crazy drinking nights and woken up the next day lighter because they're smart about the timing and how they schedule their food around it so and by omitting all the foods that you tend to enjoy in the past by omitting alcohol trying to increase your exercise and then doing this like detox fad all in one go it's overwhelming and it's setting you up for failure so doing it in stages and being more realistic about what you can change now and then work towards it but what i usually uh, recommend to my clients is take care of your food now understand how your body feels when it's nourished understand like how your gut health is supposed to be supported and then we'll focus on alcohol and working in the exercise but the thing is no matter how much we care about it weight definitely isn't everything i think one of the biggest myths around facts if you're overweight a side effect of getting healthy is weight loss but just because you're losing weight that definitely doesn't mean you're healthy i think a lot of people are more unhealthy these days because of the strategy they use to lose weight around weight loss and weight is that the overweight equals unhealthy and normal weight equals healthy as defined by the BMI category. BMI is a very inaccurate myth. I'm obese as BMI because these these muscles makes me heavier which makes me seem obese. I'm not obese. Of health because it is just looking at your height and weight um, without taking into account what your metabolic factors and parameters are, what is your physiological health, your physical health, your sleep, your mental health, your relationship to food, um, you know, and, and I think it's very important to factor those things if you really want to define someone, you know, as healthy. And if we're not going to look at it more holistically, um, I think what that does is it marginalizes people in bigger bodies. Plus, not everyone can lose weight, even if they're putting in the same effort. That's a very common myth that everybody should have should has the same ability to lose weight and if all, everybody eats the same way they're going to look the same way which is very untrue and that's incorrect facts 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 everyone's journey is different there's no right answer here right that's why like the work i do with my clients it's very custom it's very individual people are eating in very very different ways the reason for that is I think it's important to understand that someone's weight is a factor of so many different things. It is so complex all the way from your genetic predispositions, your past, um, your family history, your past medical history, your um, you know, relationship to food as you're growing up, because not everybody has access to food, because health is about inclusion, access, connection, joy, uh, physiological well-being, and we have to take those factors into account. Boom! Man! All right, so impressions here there's man there's so many just myths there's so many different ways to look at things and i just think it gets complicated when words you use aren't fully defined and they're not paid attention to or maybe they're uh, misunderstood right like if if someone said like you can never lose weight or you should never skip a meal or you should never starve starving skipping a meal is two different things the word never throws a different wrench into the situation so i understand how this stuff can be complicated especially because new research new opinions are coming out all the time my biggest recommendation would be to listen to your body you know everyone's going to be different find what works for you if you're looking for help definitely check the training in the description of this video we kind of walk you through or we do walk you through step by step what we do and why it's so effective and so much easier than most other weight loss strategies however it's definitely worth still just tuning into your body doing your own research to figure out what works best for you i appreciate you guys if you enjoyed this video leave a comment down below like the video definitely hit that subscribe button and that bell icon and i appreciate you guys a ton with that being said of course as always make sure to eat smart move more sleep deep and be grateful for this moment. I'll see you in the next video.